it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. Tonight we are going to be dealing with a really, really important subject, but also I've got, I'm telling you, I really have an amazing revelation for you guys. I, uh, I wasn't even going to be doing the program on this subject tonight. Tonight was not going to be a revealing prophecy program tonight was just going to be uh, a regular edition of the report or any report but instead while I was doing my Bible study this week I came across um, several things that the Lord see we first let me say this when when we read the Bible when we study the Bible we are we're supposed to study it and meditate on it until it actually sinks in to our minds and the Holy Spirit reveals the truth of it uh, you know i i know that this is true for me and i'm sure it's true for a lot of you too you know you you can be reading the word of god and something just jump out at you you'll be reading something that you've read a hundred times before and you've never seen what just jumps out at you and the reason that is for most is because when they're reading the bible they're doing just that they're reading the bible they're just reading it uh, you know the way the Word of God tells us to study Scripture is we are supposed to read it and study it precept upon precept and, and line upon line. And tonight, I am going to be challenging all of you intellectually, but I'm also going to be challenging you guys spiritually because we're going to be looking at the 144,000 in Revelation, and tonight I am really going to be. Uh, hey guys, I, I see I see your um, I see your comments. I really do, and I appreciate them. Hey, I love you all. But if I don't respond, please don't uh, please don't uh, take it the wrong way or personally. I just I've got a lot to present and not a lot of time to do it in, so. I want to make sure that I get all of it in there, and then if we have time, you know, uh, we can have some dialogue afterwards. But tonight I'm going to be presenting a paradigm on the 144,000 that is definitely not the majority view. Uh, you know, the majority view on the 144,000 is a dispensational view. But that being the case... <laughs> Kingdom family, before we jump into the 144,000, allow me to tell you guys about the new Kingdom Productions Network store. We have got the new Remnant Watchman's t-shirt as well as the new Remnant Report t-shirt and much, much more. So check out the store. The, 
I don't believe that my view on a lot of things in scripture is the same as the majority opinion. And, you know, that, that is, that's actually uh, a good thing to me because, um, you know, the, the majority of doctrine, especially in the United States, is dispensational. And also, Jesus Christ said that the way is the way is narrow, and there are few, few who find it. Not the majority will find it, but there are few who find it. And so because of that, to me, it's a good thing that, you know, my view is different than the majority because the majority is almost always wrong. And, you know, they're going up that broad road. But tonight we are, we're going to be in Revelation. So uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 7. We're going to be starting in chapter 7, starting in verse 3. And, and we're going to answer, first of all, what are the 144,000? Revelation 7 and 3, it says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So the 144,000 are servants. There are no true servants of God that are not born again believers. Now, the majority opinion, the dispensational opinion, is that these are 144,000 ethnic Jewish evangelists. Now, that just makes my head spin. You know, when you begin talking about race, I'm sorry. You know, so, so here, God's going to call out 104,000 ethnic Jewish evangelists. Well, how much... Jewish blood uh, do you have to have to be eligible for the 144,000? Uh, I mean, you know, is it 70%? Is it, uh, is it 90%? Is it 100%? Because if it is, you're out of luck. Uh, it, it, it makes my head spin to even think about it. You, you know, these are servants of God, and there are no servants of God that are not born again believers. And this end time remnant of God are going to be believers. Now. In verse 4, it says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And everybody, everybody that's saved, that is a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, is a part of Israel, of God. The old covenant was with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, Jeremiah 31, and Hebrews 8. The new covenant is with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Born again believers, we are the Israel of God. So, you know, we're looking at the end time remnant of God. Now, where the number 144,000 comes in, and this is, this is where the things that I studied all throughout the week, you know, I, I'd see one thing and then I'd I actually, I've got to, I've got to give credit where credit is due. <laughs> Brother James Fraser was the one who originally got me comparing scripture. He got me uh, reading and comparing scripture. He was doing a study on Zechariah, and uh, you know, I, I had looked at what he was looking at several times. So instead of going to Zechariah, I went to some places in the New Testament, but I also went through the Old Testament, and I started in Revelation. And I, I because I've been trying to. Uh, I've been trying to put a lot of puzzle pieces together as far where the end times are concerned. And this part here, this next part, where the number of the 144,000 comes in, this is when, because I know James and my dad and, and, and several others watching probably already knew that my view on the 144,000 was not the view that they were ethnic Jewish evangelists. However, my view was that they were um, well, well, we'll get to that in a minute. First, let me let me show you where the number 144,000 comes into play. Let's read Revelation 21, verses 12, 12 
through 14. And we're going to see that this also speaks to the totality of the people of God. Revelation 21, verses 12 through 14. And had a great, and had a great and high, and had a great, excuse me, had a wall, great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So, 12 times 12 is 144. The 12 apostles 12 times the 12 tribes. This is symbolic of the totality of the people of God. When all of the saved Jews and all of the saved Gentiles are brought together in the Israel of God, here uh, in Revelation 21, this is actually speaking of the New Jerusalem. Now, where the, the thousand comes from, uh, you don't have to turn here because I've got it marked, but where the thousand comes from is in Psalms and the covenant of Abraham is spoken of symbolically with the number 1000. And this is why we see the number 1000 so prominently in the book of Revelation. It's a symbolic number. Psalm 105 verse 8 and 9 says, He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. So 12 times 12 is 144 times a thousand, the symbolic number of the covenant. And there you go. You got 144,000. Now, comparing this, there's something, there's something that stands out big time. Sorry, I'm going to have to, uh, got stuff popping up on my screen. All right, that was a uh, Mary sharing it. I, I forget I'm not screen sharing right now, so y'all can't see that. I apologize. Uh, I'm sure that you guys will be very, very, thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. I'm sure you guys will be very familiar with this passage, but let's go ahead and and let's read Revelation 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand, and on and on. And what this is doing, this is a census. Just like in the book of Numbers, just like in Chronicles, when the Lord took census of the children of Israel, it's because they were going to war. This is a census. This is the roll call of God's end time army. And it's not a matter of whether God's going to win the war or not. He's going to win the war. But what it's a matter of is if we're going to be in the army, if you're going to be in the army. And there is a ceiling that's taking place. And the perspective that I want to present to you tonight is that you, and I very well might be a part of this 144,000. We are in the time right now when God is sealing and setting apart his end time army. God is taking his senses and those who are sealed are going to take their place in the coming battle. That's that this battle, I believe with all of my heart, it is just over the horizon. I mean, it, it could actually break out anytime, even before this program is over. It is just that imminent. Now, Let's look at Revelation 7 and 3 and ask yourself this question. What are they sealed from? And the sealing means protection. We're going to talk about what the seal is in just a few minutes, but we're going to ask what are they sealed from because we don't want to miss this. Revelation 7 and 3 saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And what we see here is God holding back the judgment He's holding back the judgment until his servants are sealed because the sealing is the protection. And right now, like I said, the sealing is going on. He's taking the census of his soldiers and people are either going to step up or they're going to step back. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 8 and we're going to see why you want to be sealed. Why you would like to be a part and why you want to be a part of the sealing and be sealed and be part of the end time army and we're going to look here in revelation chapter 8 and, and 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 see i believe that that revelation chapter 8 is the place where the restrainer is removed 
And I don't believe the restrainer is the Holy Spirit that's popularly taught in churches today, but I believe the restrainer is the archangel Michael. And in Revelation chapter 8, the, re the restrainer, he's going to be removed, and it's going to be game on. We see in Revelation 7 that God was, I mean, he was holding back, and he is holding back the four winds until the servants of God are sealed. But when God's end time army are sealed, the restrainer is going to be removed, and those who are not sealed are going to be in a lot of trouble, because this is what's going to come down. Verse 7 of Revelation chapter 8 says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast out upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. He's going to hurt the earth, and he's going to hurt the trees. Verse 8 says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. He's going to hurt the earth. He's going to hurt the sea. He's going to hurt the trees and God's people. God is purposely holding this back right now until his people are sealed. But you see, the, the, what we want to appreciate is that, that God isn't going to wait until he gets a huge army, a whole bunch of people, because he's going to win the, the war regardless. But, but like I said, it, it, it's not a matter of whether he's going to win the war. It's a matter of whether we're going to be in the army. Now, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 9 and verse 4. And this is the difference. We see here in Revelation 9 and verse 4, the difference between the sealed and the unsealed in the Great Tribulation. And, you know, I uh, believe with all my heart, I, you know, I am a hardcore post-tripper. I am, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't like to uh, argue with people who, who disagree, and I try to be gracious, but I believe this very strongly. I firmly believe it. There's not a shadow of a doubt in my mind that this is true and that God wants people warned. You know, he wants people. This is what I want you guys to consider. This 144,000 ethnic Jewish evangelists, that is wrong. Because if you believe that and you're not an ethnic Jew, then you might not think you're going to be a part of this. But I'm telling you tonight, it's not about your race, your color. It is about whether you are the sealed of God and going to be in this end times army. And we're going to talk tonight in just a few minutes about what it takes to be a part of this end times army and become the sealed of God. Revelation 9 and verse 4, it says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. You see, when the pit is opened in Revelation 9, if you've got the seal of God upon your forehead, you'll be protected from these chimeric, uh, demonic creatures, entities that come out of the pit. See, you want to make sure you're sealed because if you are not, then you're going to be at the mercy of these demonic creatures. Now, we're going to turn over and look at Revelation chapter 16. And all through the book of Revelation, we see that having the seal of God, this is what's going to give us supernatural protection through the Great Tribulation. You know, in Revelation 16 and 2, it says, And the, 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 first, the first went out and poured his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which were shipped his image, which worshipped his image, not shipped, worshipped his image. Now, Revelation chapter 16 is talking about the vials. We read just a little while ago in Revelation 7 and Revelation chapter 8. And Revelation chapter 8, it was the seals. And in Revelation chapter 16, it is the vials. Now, we're talking about supernatural protection for God's end time army by being the sealed of God. And I'm going to tell you something. This is answering the dispensationals, their doctrine. This is answering the question. There's a question that was raised in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. And it's talking about the church of Philadelphia. And I always wondered... Uh, Guys, somebody just said in the chat, I don't know if you can see it or not, not in the, the Remnant Report chat, I, I haven't seen any from there, but in the, the Deception Report chat, somebody just said they can't get the video to play. Uh, if, Mary, maybe if you can, you can um, 
see what's going on. If not, you know, maybe they'll be able to watch the replay. But in Revelation chapter 3 here in the church of Philadelphia, and I've always wondered about this. It was amazing to me how this, this revelation that the Lord showed me, that the Holy Spirit showed me in the Word of God, answered the question that I had, the only question that I had in my mind about the pre-trib rapture was because of what dispensationalists say about Revelation 3 and, and the Church of Philadelphia in, in Revelation 3-7. And, you know, it says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them which dwell upon the earth. This is how we're going to be kept by having the seal of God upon us. Now let's look at a few scriptures and see very specifically what the seal of God is. First, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. 2 Corinthians 1, 22. Who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts? And the, the Holy Spirit is the seal. And that word, that word earnest means like, like a, a payment, a down payment, you know, like, like earnest money. It's, it's a down payment until you get the, the whole piece of land. Um, th there's also a scripture that we need to, to consider in along with this one and we understand that the holy spirit is our seal but there is a warning in ephesians chapter four i think give me just a second yeah ephesians chapter four in ephesians four in verse 30 and grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption there's a warning there for us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. That because the Holy Spirit seals us, and and the implication there is that we might lose a seal, blow a seal, and we might we might come to the place where we go from being under the protection of God to going out from under the protection of God. And you know, that actually goes along perfectly with what tonight's program was originally going to be about. And next week, next week. I am definitely going to have the program on salvation. And I may even do a Saturday program. It's been a long time since I've done a Saturday program. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But the best passage that talks about what it takes to be sealed is from the words of Jesus and the doctrine of Christ. Anybody who know me knows that I make all of my doctrine and all of my beliefs, my theology, all of it has to be found in the doctrine of Christ. And friends, that is what did it more than anything for me with this here, this revelation, because it's actually found within the doctrine of Christ. First of all, Christ himself was the one who was speaking to the church in Philadelphia, and the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. But we're going to see more than that. We're going to go to the book of John, chapter 3. And verse, uh, give me a second, verse 31. And the scripture says here, He that cometh from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthy, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Now look at verse 33. And, and this is talking about Jesus coming down and speaking to us when he was incarnated at, at Bethlehem and became fully God and fully man. And lived a sinless life and died on the cross for our sins. But look at verse 33. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. And when we, when we receive the testimony of Jesus, we set to our seal that God is true. And, and, and anybody that knows me, I've, I've said it once, I'll say it again. They know that I am all about the doctrine of Christ. Everything I believe is determined by what Jesus said. In 2 John 9, Jesus says, well, actually, John said it. If any man hath not the doctrine of Christ, he's not of God. Don't receive him into your house. And you can know one thing. Whenever you disagree with something Jesus said, you're going to be wrong and not him. Because he came from heaven to testify those words of the Father. And when we believe him, 
when we trust what he said and when we place our faith in what he did on the cross and we keep it there, we set to our seal that God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Now, how do you know if you're sealed? Well, I'm going to tell you. Let's go. There's a parallel here. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4. And this is how you're going to know if you're sealed of God. And there's a historical parallel here that, that took place in 586 B.C. When, when God brought judgment on the, the nation of Israel. And at that time, as always, God spared the remnant. It, it's never about the masses. The judgment always falls on the masses. But it's always about the godly remnant that, godly bring, that God brings through the judgment safely. And this is what God's concerned with now in with the, the end times. God has taken a census and he's, he's sealing people for his end time army. He wants, he wants to know how many he can count on. He's giving people assignments. He's giving people specific instructions through the Holy Spirit. He's developing relationships. You know, he's putting people in specific locations for what is coming. Mary and I and Tori and James and a few others in October, the end of October, on the devil's favorite night. Well, actually, starting on October 30th, we're going to have the remnant survivalist retreat. We're going to be getting together. We're going to be training God's end time remnant. And we're also going to be coming together. And we are going to be worshiping, praising the Lord, and kicking the devil in the face on Halloween. But now let's look in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 9. You know, this is, this is what happened when Jerusalem fell. And he said, he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, cause them that hath charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, and every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed with linen with the writer's ink on his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherubs, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called of the man clothed in linen, which had the writer's ink horn by his side, and the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. What determine whether a man or a woman was sealed or not is if the abominations that were being committed by the nation and the religious system caused them to sigh and cry and grieve their spirit. If you are not bothered tonight by the things, the idolatry, and the wickedness that are going on in our nation, the idolatry that is going on in our church, then, friends, you are not sealed of God. But tonight, if you are sick to your stomach and grieved in your spirit by the idolatry of our nation and the apostasy of the American church, then welcome to God's end-time army. Take out a number, take a number, and wait for your instructions from the Holy Spirit. Friends, I am here to tell you tonight that the 144,000 are not ethnic Jewish evangelists. At, they are not that at all. They are the blood-bought children of God, no matter what race, color, ethnicity, or creed they are. God is now sending out the recruitment orders to his people to take their place, to stand in their place in God's end time army. And this is exactly how you tell. The book of Acts chapter 17 says, you know, I got to ask because it's important. And I feel it so much that it, it, it grieves me in my spirit and I, I get emotional sometimes. And sometimes I, I talk with people, people I'm close with. And all they can think about is who's going to win an election. Or who's rioting over here? Whether whether our whether our government is going to be capitalist or socialist? When we should be grieved in our spirit by every ounce of it. Capitalism is the love of money. Socialism is just the other side of it, and they're both idolatry. 
If you are in the kingdom of God, you should be focused on the kingdom of God. And you have a constitution that you need to worry about. It's right here. This is our constitution. Our government was, is set up and our king is Jesus Christ. The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And that's who I follow. For those who can't understand it, I, I am sorry. I love you and I will agree to disagree with you. But it's not me that you have to agree or disagree with. You have to decide. Are you going to be marked and sealed of God or not? If it doesn't make you sick when they have the naked cowboy up at the Hillsong churches, if it doesn't make you sick that these 501c3 churches like Joel Osteen's church and the Bethel Church in Reading, if that doesn't grieve your spirit, if it doesn't grieve your spirit when they light up the towers in New York for the abortion, the colors for abortion, to kill the innocents. If that doesn't grieve your spirit, friends, then you are not in the army of God. I can remember, I can remember a time when none of that bothered me. I could care less about it. I didn't even think about it to care about it. But I thank God that he has changed me from the inside out and changed my priorities and filled me with his Holy Spirit. Now let's go to Acts. Now, it says here, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. His spirit was stirred at idolatry. Now, this, friends, this is what really, really troubles me. Pay attention. Most people that attend churches in America, they aren't bothered by idolatry a bit. They are not bothered a bit. It doesn't matter to them. And, of course, Freemasonry is an obvious example, which is so obvious to me that every Freemason is an idolatry. Every time they go in the lodge, they open and close in prayer to a God that's not the God of the Bible. And the American churches, they need a newsflash. Idolatry is still a sin. The people that have the Holy Spirit in them, they still get sick to their stomach. And they, they still are grieved in their spirit when they see idolatry. God said, have no other gods before him. And that still holds true tonight. It still holds true that God's people that receive the seal of the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit is in you, you will be grieved by idolatry because God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So are you stirred tonight? Are you stirred and are you repulsed with what's going on with the pedophilia, the abortion, the idolatry, the putting country before God? If you are stirred in your spirit, if the Holy Spirit has grieved you, then step up and take a number. There's a scripture that truly frightens me. It, it's, it's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. And, and I, I truly fear that this the scripture applies to far too many in the American religious system. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. And, and it describes the person that is religious, but yet has totally lost the relationship with God. In Ephesians chapter 4, 18, having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling. Now, that's what really scares me. They are past feeling. They are, they are not moved and grieved at the abominations. They cannot feel a holy stirring in their heart for idolatry. It does not bother them because they're past feeling. Somewhere along the line, that tenderness of their heart has gone hard. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit that once bothered them when they sinned, that's gone. They're past feeling. They're not bothered by Mason pastors. They're, they're not bothered by the pagan holidays. They're not bothered by anything because they are past feeling. And 
That's a very, very frightening thing. You know, so many things come to mind when thinking about the 144,000 or and even the Masons, the, the, the dispensationalists, the Masons, the, the, the teachings of 40,000 some odd dispensational churches that, that teach that only ethnic Jewish evangelists will be the seal of God in 144,000. Then you've got the Jehovah's Witnesses that think that only they will be the 144,000. But then you, you, you read the scriptures and you go line upon line, precept upon precept. You prove everything by two or three witnesses. There is no mistaking who the 144,000 are. And it grieves my heart to see these people tossed to and fro, to and fro by every wind of doctrine. I, I knew a couple. Actually, I didn't know a couple. Uh, uh, a friend of mine was telling me about a couple who were on fire for the Lord. They were exposing things left and right, telling truth. And then they just fell away. They, they, they just went completely liberal. And, and I'm not talking Democrat, Republican, Republican, uh, Po politically liberal. I'm talking lib uh, liberal mindset to where, where people are okay of homosexuality in the church, and they were, and all these abominations that that are all around us here in America. And I understand how and why people can believe the dispensational doctrines of devils, and that's what they are. The devil, any, let me tell you something, friends, and, and I have dispensational friends and I love them and I believe they love the Lord, but that doesn't change the fact that they're deceived. And any doctrine that is not from God, by definition, is from the devil. So it's a doctrine of demons. I'm sorry, it's the way it is. And I understand the way that they can believe these lies. It's because they do not study the word of God for themselves. That is so important. It's important to forsake not the gathering together amongst ourselves, and which is going to church and fellowshipping with others and, and coming together and serving and worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That is important. But you, no matter how much faith you have in your pastor, you should never take his word for what the Bible says or what it means. Don't take my word for anything I'm saying here tonight. If you were not able to follow along in the word of God with me, because I was going kind of fast, if you weren't able to follow along, I pray that you at least wrote the scriptures down and went back and, and so you can go back and read them for yourself. Do not listen to any man when it comes to doctrine, because your doctrine, the way you believe about the word of God, will decide where you're going in eternity. If you have been taught wrong about salvation, then you may very well wind up in hell. If you were taught wrong about the tribulation, the rapture, the 144,000, then you may very well find yourself in the great falling away because you've lost faith because everything you've ever heard is a lie and you see it in front of your face. When that day comes and there is absolutely no denying that we are standing in the middle of the tribulation, there will be a lot who lose heart, who lose hope, who lose faith because they put their hope and faith in man instead of God. They put their faith in their pastor instead of the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And it blows my mind how... People, these pastors can, can, can read the Bible and look over the fact that Revelation chapter 7, when it's talking about the 144,000, when, when the book of Revelation is describing the 144,000, even if you're just reading Revelation and you haven't gone to all the other places in the Bible to see what it means to be the seal of God, to find out that this is a representation of the Israel of God. If you're, even if they're just reading Revelation, you can't get 
144,000 Jewish, ethnic Jewish evangelists when the, the word says 12,000 from each tribe. Each tribe is not Jewish. And that is, that is just mind-blowing to me. How pastors can be so deceived and not know what the heck the word of God is talking about. And, and we have to ask ourselves the que this question. You know, there's all kinds of just crazy interpretations of the 144,000. We've talked about the 144,000. The We've talked about the Jehovah Witness doctrine. But like I said earlier, with, with the dispensational doctrine, it just makes my head spin. Like, you, you'd have to ask, what percent of ethnicity do you have to have to qualify for the remnant the, the, the 144,000, the end time army. And what gets me more than that is these, these pastors who actually believe that not only are there going to be 12,000 from each of the tribes or 144,000 ethnic Jews when it says 12,000 from each tribe, but they actually believe that they're going to be virgins. The virgins, the 144,000 12,000 from each tribe that are virgins. It talks about their pureness because if you are in Jesus Christ, if you are a blood-bought member of the kingdom, then your sins have been washed away and you are as white as snow, as clean as a virgin. It is clear as day representing the end-time remnant of God. And people just ignore the word of God altogether. They seriously don't care about taking scripture out of context. And it, it, it gets back to the same idea that, that most people in the churches in America, they believe that there was an old covenant with Israel and a new covenant with the church. And until they figure out that the old and the new covenant was with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, nothing can be more plain biblically until they get that right, they're not going to get this or a lot of other things right. And, and we we have to ask ourselves this question. You know, I'm a, I'm a very firm believer that, that truth comes, you know, like I said, from precept upon precept, line upon line. You have to get square one right, and then you can go to square two, and then you'll get square two right. And error is also not random. Friends, every error is designed by Satan to cover up a precious truth of God that we need to know. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that believes in the dispensational doctrines are uh, filled with devils or anything like that, but they are believing a doctrine from Satan. And it's because, I mean, just, you know, what does the dispensational teaching and the Jehovah Witnesses teaching, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that they're the elect and the, the dispensational teaching, we went over and over and over, and, and both of those teachings, they will, they will make everyone listening tonight and, and everyone in these churches, they will make them believe that, that they have no way and no part to be in that 144,000 unless they happen to be ethnic, ethnically Jewish or, or or unless they're a part of the hierarchy of the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the only way that they'll believe that they can take part in this if they believe and have been taught those doctrines of devils. And that's why I want all of you to hear me. I'm going to say loud and clear, you tonight listening to this program, you can be a part of the 144,000. The sealing process is going on right now, and you can be a part of it. This is a call to war. And I believe that we are standing at the time when this can break loose at any time. I think that anybody that's paying attention at all knows the serious of the situation we're in. You know, Isaiah 17, 1 says that one day Damascus is just going to go away. It's going to cease from being a city in one day. Trumpet's going to blow and we're going to be in the midst of World War III. And it can happen at any time with all of the, the rioting and the race baiting and the elites that are pitting the races and the religions against each other. You know, I, I can see it happening. And, you know, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about anything political tonight, 
but you've got the Abraham Accords. Friends, if you cannot see that the Abraham Accords are prophetic, then you're blind. I love you, but you're blind. And we're not going to get talk about it here tonight, but if you don't know what the Abraham Accords are, after the show's over, go Google it. Go Google the Abraham Accords and also <laughs> look into who is responsible for the Abraham Accords. You know, I'd love to sit here and tell you that it was Donald Trump, but it wasn't. You know, he was the face that everybody saw. You know, he was the one signing the papers, but there was a man in the background. There was a man in the background. Go research the Abraham Accords. Find out who that man in the background was, and you'll be hitting on something. Now, there is, there's something about, I want to get back to the issue at hand. I got off on a rabbit trail and a rant, but back to the issue at hand. In Revelation 7, that, that there's something about this genealogy and the census of Revelation that's unique from all of the other genealogies. And it starts with Judah instead of Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn, but this genealogy starts with Judah. And that would make sense, wouldn't it? Because Jesus came from the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah. And if this is God's end time army, it would make sense that Judah would be first. But what else is interesting? The tribe of Dan is left out. And it was believed from the earliest times by the apostolic fathers that the, the beast of Revelation 13 was going to come from the tribe of Dan. Now, what I want us to notice here tonight is there are two lion's whelps. I'm going to turn real quick to Genesis, Genesis chapter, let's see, give me just a second. This is one I didn't write down, but I do know it by heart. I just got to make sure I'm right. Genesis chapter 39, I believe. Sorry, guys, this is important. If it wasn't, I'd skip it, but it's important. All right. And, you know, there are many, like I said, that the, the early church fathers believed that the beast of Revelation 13 was going to come from the tribe of Dan. And I have also thought this from time to time. I've, I have, uh, I've had other theories and other beliefs, but the fact that he, he could come from the, tr the tribe of Dan has, has always been in the back of my mind. And, you know, I did a pro program a few weeks back about the Antichrist, and I made no secret of my beliefs that uh, President Trump was the best candidate for the Antichrist. But I'm going to tell you something. I've been doing a lot of studying since then because I, I never said that the man was. I said that, in my opinion, he was the best candidate. But as I've studied and prayed... I believe that he's got something to do with it, but just remember what I was saying earlier about those Abraham Accords and the man in the background, and let's look and see if the tribe of Dan could possibly produce the beast of Revelation 13, and, you know, I've heard... I've heard Gary Wayne, actually. Gary Wayne was the first person that I heard talk about this. And, and Gary Wayne actually connected, connected this with the Priory of Sion. And for those of you who don't know what the Priory of Sion was, it, it, was, it was a secret society uh, in, that had to do with the, the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits. And Gary Wayne was the first person I heard talk about it. But in Genesis chapter 49, in verse 9, it says, Judah is a lion's whelp. And Judah is a lion's whelp. And I pray, my son, and he's crouched as a lion and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. And Judah, which is the first variation is a lion's whelp. But we're going to look at Deuteronomy. And it's, and it's interesting that the other lion's whelp is the other unique thing about this unique thing in the genealogy in Revelation. It begins with, with Judah instead of Reuben, and it leaves out Dan. And in Deuteronomy 33, 22, the scripture says, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. 
they shine. Now, I want to read you guys something from Irenaeus. Irenaeus was an early church father, and he, he had a pretty, a pre, pretty good spiritual heritage. Irenaeus was taught by Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of the apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. So we have here in Irenaeus, we've got an apostle of the man who was taught I mean, excuse me, a disciple of the man who was taught by the Apostle John, John the Revelator. And he's going, Irenaeus is going to give us an interpretation on Jeremiah 8, 16. And I'd like to get to Jeremiah too. I want to read Irenaeus and Jeremiah if I can. If not, I'll just read Irenaeus in, in interpretation. All right. It's uh, Jeremiah 8 and 16. It says, The snorting of his horses, horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of the strong ones, for they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. Now, this is the interpretation of Irenaeus. He says, when they shall say, when sudden destruction shall come upon them. And, and Jeremiah, does, Jeremiah does not only talk about his sudden coming, but he even indicates the tribe from which he shall come. He says, when, when you shall hear the voices of the, the swift horses of Dan, the whole earth shall be moved by the galloping horses. He shall also come and devour the earth and the fullness thereof and the city also and they that dwell therein. This too is the reason that this tribe is not reckoned in the apocalypse along with those who are saved. Now, Irenaeus says, listen to this. Irenaeus says, this is why the tribe of Dan is not reckoned along with those that are saved. He didn't say along with the Jewish evangelist. He said along with those who are saved. Now, the very next verse in Jeremiah 8, 17, and guess who's back? The next verse after the scripture that Irenaeus said that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan, he says, for behold, I will send serpents cockatrices among you which will not be charmed and they shall bite you saith the lord and not everybody knows but a lot of us know that watch the remnant report that the cockatrice is the basilisk and here we have the promise of god that he is going to send a basilisk among the people for judgment that they would not charm them that they would be bitten and die Remember in Revelation chapter 9, we talked about and saw the basilisk and, and, or these, these chimeras, these, gen, these genetic mutations that would come out of the pit in Revelation 9. And remember Revelation 9 and 4, it, it, it said that only those that did not have the seal of God in their foreheads, only them would fall prey to these chimeric beasts in Revelation 9. This in Jeremiah is an absolute confirmation that we are going to be subjective to this kind of warfare. Actually, this in Revelation 9 is a confirmation. And friends, there's one thing you need to know. All throughout the Old Testament, when God is taking census, you can know that there is a battle coming on. And we are coming up on a war that we are we want to be sealed for. Trust me, you do not want to miss out on the supernatural protection of the sealing of God. Now, I want to make this clear. I want everybody to understand exactly what I am saying. I'm not saying that only 144,000 will be sealed. What I am saying is that 
the body of Christ, the Israel of God, you and I, and absolutely everyone, Jew, Gentile, does not matter, male, female, does not matter. If you are in Christ Jesus, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And as long as you stay true to the Lord Jesus Christ and you do not fall prey to the great falling away, friends, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, I want to turn to one more thing because I want to make, I want to make a, I want to make one more connection here. I have uh, pretty much said all I'm going to say tonight about the 144,000 uh, and who they are. I think I have shown through the scriptures that they are not ethnic Jewish people. And, you know, I used to believe that the same thing I believe now about them being um, part of the body of Christ. But I believed before, before the Holy Spirit made, showed me these things in Scripture and I connected the dots. You know, um, I believed that they were part of the body of Christ, that they were members of the body. But I believed that they were both actual ethnic uh, people, believers, that ethnic males from the, the tribe, each 12, uh, 12,000 from each of the tribes, just like it says, but I believed that they were first century believers that were killed for the cause of Christ that were going to come back. But the more that I have studied, the more that I see that I was wrong. And that is one thing that I love. I love that the Lord has given me the spirit of humbleness. I can be bold when I need to be bold, but I can humble myself when it's time to humble myself and say that I'm wrong. And, you know, I've taught on the 144,000 before, and I taught that they were a part of the remnant of God, but that they were also 12,000 from each of the tribes. And, and I got to tell you that uh, the, the person I heard teach that was Pastor Stephen Anderson. And I... I did my due diligence. I read behind him, and, and, and I could I could see where he got that. But uh, even though he Stephen Anderson does not believe in a pre-trib rapture, and a lot of his doctrines are not dispensational, unfortunately, Mary Callie said it best with Stephen Anderson, you have to know when to eat the meat and spit out the bones. And um, the 144,000, he, he is wronged on. The Lord has shown me the truth of it, revealed this revelation to me, and I uh, felt that I had no choice, no choice, that I had an obligation to share it with you all. Because, friends, if you can't see that we are at the door, then I would be praying for the Holy Spirit to open my eyes. But we're going to, I just want to read you this really quick, really quick. It says here, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, the harpazo, or what people like to call the rapture, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, and this is what I want you to hear, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, before the man of sin is revealed, because that's what the next line says, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. But I want you to hear this. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. A falling away to the Antichrist spirit. You know, I played on, on YouTube. I played a video that I made with different David Wilkerson clips and also pictures that were taken of actual weather events, lightning, tornadoes, supercell thunderstorms off of hurricanes that were actually made by weather modification when the two hurricanes came together and hit the coast of 
you know, our Gulf Coast and went up directly through our food supply. You know, if that wasn't weather warfare, then friends, I, I would rather believe it was weather warfare because if it wasn't weather warfare, then it was God Almighty. And we're that much closer. And this scripture means that much more. The great falling away must come first. You have a choice to make. It does, I'm talking to believers and non-believers alike, but mainly right now, I'm talking to those who consider themselves a part of the body of Christ. Friends, saying a prayer like it was magic words one day in a church building or at home alone does not by any means guarantee you a place in the kingdom. We'll go over that in full next week. But right now, I want you to hear this and consider these words. There can only be a falling away if you can make a choice to either follow Christ and be a part of the remnant or go along with the apostasy and the idolatry that's happening right now. It's in churches in every state in the country and every country in the world. There's idolatry and apostasy. The churches in America right now, they're shut down for the most part, been deemed non-essential. I want you to ask yourself a question. And the question's not, should the churches be open or should you go to church or stay home? The question you should ask yourself is, why is God allowing it to happen? He's allowing it to happen because he is not happy with the way the church is being run here in America. Now, we're not under judgment yet. God has not started judging this world. But we're at the door. And absolutely everybody that is alive will go through it. It's only a matter of whether you're going to go through it as a sealed, blood-bought member of the army of God, the remnant, end-time army of God, or you're going to go through it as one who, there's either going to be one or two things. You're either going to be a believer, but you're not going to, to be marked by the Holy Spirit to be a part of the end time army of God. And you're going to be one of those who has to stay faithful unto death and die during the tribulation. Or you're going to be lost, take the mark of the beast, and you're going to be tormented by these chimeric entities and then find yourself thrown in the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of the end time army of God. If these things truly do not bother you that's going on in this country, or if you're more concerned about politics than you are about the kingdom of God, then friends, I'm praying for you, but I would suggest that you pray for yourselves I would pray to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'd pray for that grieving. I would beg for it. Because the Bible is not wrong. The word of God says, that God be true and every man a liar. So it truly does not matter if you believe you're right and I'm wrong. It's not about me. I'm a man. I could be wrong just as easy as you. It's about this, and it's not wrong. The Bible says, the Bible says, right here again in Thessalonians, it says, we are bound to thank God always, brethren, as it is, at it is meek, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you, the churches of God, for your patience and faith in your persecutions and tribulations 
that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. So you're either going to be counted worthy or you're not. But this is going to be the righteous judgment. God is a righteous judge. He does not make mistakes. And friends, the church in Thessalonica is a far cry from the church of the United States of America. I don't care what denomination it is. I can assure you that the churches in the United States of America doesn't have their faith growing exceedingly. They don't have charity that aboundeth towards each other. We can't glory ourselves in the churches for their patience and faith because it's not there. So tonight, let's be grieved in our spirit for the abominations and the idolatry in this world, but let's be grieved in our spirit for those who are on their way to hell. Let's be grieved in our spirit for the lost souls. Friends, who did you tell about Jesus Christ today? Who did you tell about the things that Jesus has done for you today? I don't know. I can tell you honestly, I told no one except for you guys tonight. I honestly have not told a soul face to face, and I can admit that. I'm telling you guys tonight, I'm not saying that makes me righteous any more than anybody else. The Bible says no one is righteous. No, not one. My righteousness, your righteousness comes through the blood of Christ and his sacrifice only. We have this wicked flesh on us, but we have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ himself had. I read through the book of Acts today. Oh my goodness. The fight that is going through me right now came from my study and my fellowship with the Holy Spirit reading the book of Acts. I want so badly to have that spirit that Jesus Christ himself shed and gave unto his apostles. His disciples. He literally shed the Holy Spirit down to them when he ascended. Read the book of Acts for yourself. If you can't read the book of Acts and have a fire flow through your veins and your spirit from the Holy Spirit of God, then I would ask myself, am I saved? Am I a Christian? Am I a follower of Christ? Do I have the Holy Spirit? All these important questions the most important question and friends i'm going to challenge you and i'm going to challenge myself tomorrow to tell somebody about jesus christ and what he's done for me and i challenge you to do the same and i challenge you to let them know also how close we are to the end if you don't know yourself where to go in the word of god to Share these things with them. Feel free to message me or feel free to watch this program or any other. Anyone, you, you can go through the archives and you can find my programs that actually tell you exactly what to do. But if you don't have time to go through all that, hit me up on Messenger. I'll be glad to help in any way I can. Guys, that's going to do it for this edition of the Remnant Report. I love each and every one of you. I'm going to close in prayer. And that's going to end the program. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you now, Lord. I thank you so much for this opportunity you've given me to share your word with each and everyone who saw and heard the program tonight and everyone who will hear it in the future, Father, on Facebook, on YouTube, and in the archives, on the website. Father God, I pray that you just open up their hearts and minds and allow them to be able to comprehend and understand the revelation that you showed me in your word that I shared with them. Father God, I know that you are holding back your judgment right now. You're holding back the four winds. But there's coming a day soon when you are no longer going to hold back that judgment. And when judgment comes, Father, I pray that as many as would hear the truth from your word 
and as many as you would will and allow to be marked and sealed as a part of the end times army, your remnant. Father, I pray that your grace may abound a little longer so that as many as can will surrender, that they will surrender all to you because that is the key, surrendering all, absolutely everything, to give up that fear of what's going to happen if this man gets elected, if what's going to happen if this government comes into power, to put that fear, to give it to you, God. Because through you is the only way we'll conquer that fear and truly start living in the kingdom, for the kingdom, by our, our instructions that you've given us, our constitution, the word of God, the Ten Commandments, your law, the red letters, the doctrine of Christ, every word of God. Father God, I love you, and I ask all these things in the mighty and holy name of the King of Kings, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Amen, friends. I love each and every one of you. And for the next chapter, Radio Network and the Remnant Report, until next time, I'm the Remnant Warrior saying good night and God bless. <laughs>